Good evening. I am uh, alone right now. I'll hopefully be joined soon by retired NYPD Chief of Detectives Joe Borelli, uh, who has yet to sign on, but hopefully he'll sign on shortly. But welcome, nonetheless, to episode 147 of the Mike the New Haven podcast. I hope it won't be just me riffing here, uh, but I wanted to keep you guys entertained. I didn't want to start too late. Uh, I wanted there to be maybe a little bit of a grace period before we started, but I figured, you know what, let me hop on. And let me start talking uh, to you guys and hopefully keeping you entertained until Chief Borelli does indeed sign on. I hope to see him soon. Uh, but in the meantime, like I said, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 147 of the Mike to New Haven podcast. As I see my two friends, Scott Wagner and Bob Geis, immediately tune in. Uh, welcome, guys. Good to see you. I'm waiting for Chief Borelli to sign on here. Uh, Chief Borelli, he's, he's up there. He's 90. So, uh, you know, technology and, and doing dry runs with him, with him behind the scenes was fun because he was learning about this stuff for the first time. Um, so hopefully he'll click that link and he'll be here in short order. And, and to give you a little bit of background on Joe Borelli, and by the way, before I do that, I should say, um, check out if you haven't the previous episodes. Uh, it was two in one day. It was Phil Grimaldi for the first one. He was taking me down memory lane for a chase he had. Uh, back in March of 1985 uh, in Brooklyn, which was reminiscent to the 1971 movie that played a huge role in him becoming a cop, and that's The French Connection. And then later on that day was volume one of the new miniseries, Talk to Me, Life on the NYPD's Hostage Negotiation Team, and that uh, was with Jack Cambria, who ran that unit, was a part of that unit for longer, but was the commanding officer of that unit for 14 years, the last 14 years of his career. 2001 to 2015. Before that, the guy was in ESU for a long time, parts of 16 years. He split time between ESU and the 72nd Precinct over in the Sunset Park section of Brooklyn. Uh, Scotty, I did get the pick I sent you. I do have it. Good pick. Good pick. Uh, and I'll try to showcase it um, tonight if I can, depending on the flow of the show. If he's in the middle of a good story, I, I don't want to cut him off, but um, I'll try to get that pick up there. I'm hoping he signs on soon. Uh, but to give you background on Joe, Joe was in the NYPD for 39 years, almost 40, just shy of 40. He came on in 1957, and he saw the evolution of the city really through the good, the bad, the ugly, and then back to good. Because the 50s and the early 60s were a relatively peaceful time for the city. Things declined in, in the late 60s into the 70s. The 70s and the 80s were really bad, early 90s, really bad. But then the mid-90s, things returned and there was that renaissance and he was there for all of that um you know for really parts not parts but basically most of four decades but what made him such a legend in the department was the fact that he was on the son of sam case and not only that he was leading the task force that ultimately apprehended david berkowitz who went on a, a an absolutely terrifying spree in the mid-1970s in, in which he had numerous victims, all of them young victims, to usually young couples is who he would target. And um, he ultimately was, well, he was a lieutenant at the time. And his efforts ultimately led to that capture. As a matter of fact, Berkowitz wrote him a letter directly addressing him uh, in his Lindbrook, Lindbrook uh, address. So, you know, he's got an interesting story to tell with that. And I'm waiting for him to sign on here. But I appreciate you guys being here. In the meantime, while I wait for him to get here, um, if you have any questions for me, fire away. Oh, he says you met Joe Bob Geis, who should come on the show, by the way. He says you met Joe once when you worked in the Zodiac case. It's funny because one of my friends from the bomb squad, uh, who hopefully will be on the show soon, Brian Hearn. <laughs> if you remember, Bob, the uh, Zodiac killer, the New York version of the Zodiac killer, had two pipe bombs when he was finally caught in 1996. That was Brian's first bomb job. That was his first bomb shop in which they, the bomb squad guys look at him and said he had just come back from the school in Alabama. He had just gotten certified and he was telling me off the air and he'll tell the story in more detail when he comes on the show. Uh, they looked at him and said, all right, it's you. So, uh, yeah, that that a lot of people forget about that. Um, but it is a, a very noteworthy case in mid 90s New York. So, um, you know, that that. uh I think that might have been one of the last cases he handled because Borelli left in 96. But he wasn't the he wasn't the chief of detectives by then. He was I don't know what role he was in. I guess I can ask him when he comes on the show, because by that point, Charlie Ruthers, the late Charlie Ruthers, who I would have loved um, to have had on the show. But he's not with us anymore. He passed away in 2015. Um, he he was the chief of detectives by then, 94 to 96. And then Pat Kelleher took over, and then the late Bill Ali uh, took over as well. So let me see if I can get in touch 
with Pirelli. Uh, but I appreciate you guys being here, Bob and Scott. Thanks a lot um, for supporting the show. I'm sorry that he's not here yet. Uh, I, I called, but I haven't gotten an answer. Um, and uh, man, I, I tell you, it's, just, it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking sometimes. You know, I had that experience for Joe Fox from like, I guess I'll just talk for 10 minutes. And then Joe Fox came on and ended up being a great interview, but Lord almighty, does that scare me? You know, um, when I don't have the guest yet. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see. He'll show, I'm sure he'll show. And uh, it, it'll be, it'll be great when he does. Yep. Okay. Duplicate there. I'm trying to submit a picture. Apologies for the feedback. And that is the uh, the pick that you sent me, Scotty. So in the meantime, if you have any, like I said, if you have any questions, fire away. And I'll make sure that uh, Joe or myself will see it. And uh, Gina G, thank you for being here. Uh, and again, I apologize that he's not here. And hopefully he can uh, show within short order. Uh, but Joe Borelli was a very, very interesting guy. And I think what's good about him still being with us and still being with the program, you know, and, and so lucid, is that you get insight into a bygone era of the department, you know. And that's the case for both the NYPD and the FDNY. And that's what I was talking about the other day when my friend Dennis Smith passed away. Um, that That is missed when these guys, you know, when they pass away. So for Joe to still be here and kind of be a representative of that era, it's a cool thing. So I called him up, but I haven't gotten an answer yet. Sent him an email, so hopefully he'll come on in short order. But I'm, I'm dying here. So, Scotty, be on the lookout. Because I might I might email this link to you, Scotty, and I might have you hop on and uh, and help me out here until Joe comes on. And maybe you can even call us to show with me tonight. So if you're if you're in suitable attire, Scotty, I'm, I might need you to bail me out here. So get ready because I might send you an email in short order um, if I don't get Joe here. But uh, in the meantime, you know, I, I'm not Mark DeMeo. I can't crack jokes. I'm not as funny as he is. But I apologize, guys, because you don't want to see me talk. You want to see Joe. But I'm waiting for him to get here. But it's, I'm figuring, I'm like, you know what? I got to go live because they're going to be waiting. They're going to be like, well, wait a minute. When's, doesn't the show, it doesn't it start at six? So I'm dying inside right now. Yes, I am because <laughs> I'm nervous. But hopefully he'll show. But, you know, actually, yeah, let me go turn around. And just Scotty, I'm going to send you the email and hop on with me. From a laptop, preferably. All right, Scotty, just sent you the email. So, oh, boy. Uh, in the meantime, how about those? Oh, he's not. Oh, okay. Well, all right. That's fine. That's fine, Scotty. He says he's not home. Oh, boy. But uh, Joe Borelli, yeah, uh, he, he was uh, living in Limbrook at the time, like I said, out in Long Island, when he was sent... Uh, a message, a letter directly addressed to him. And it had some incoherent ramblings. Mr. Berkowitz, for those of you that remember, was, you know, out of his mind. And you it was barely coherent. But the fact that it was addressed to Mr. Borelli led the Limbrook Police Department to say, I don't know, okay, we got to watch your house. Because, you know, you might not be safe. And obviously his kids were young at the time. He had his wife at home. And he never, you know, if you watch previous interviews that he's done, he's he never felt threatened by that. Never felt threatened by that, uh, surprisingly. Bob Guy says, how about those New York Rangers? Yeah. Yeah, I am, I'm working on getting a few Rangers on this show. Right now, I'd love it uh, if Borelli come on the show. Let me see if I can uh, get a hold of him here and, uh, and and speak with him. So, But in the meantime, I figured I'd keep you guys entertained. And again, I can't apologize enough. I'm sorry, guys, that he's not here yet. But when he does... Hopefully it'll be good. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. And if I can't get him tonight, I can always reschedule and I could retitle this show just riffing, I guess. Sean Avery does have a podcast, Bob Geist. Yeah, I haven't heard it. 
So we'll see. Oh boy. So, um, like I said, anybody got a question? Go ahead here. But I, I, I might, I might, uh, I might need to bring somebody on here. I have an idea of who I might bring on. Let's see. I'll send him an email right now. I won't spoil it. I won't spoil it. Hopefully, hopefully somebody can come through for me here because I'm dying. This is not good. This is not good. Uh, I'll be honest. It's not ideal. But uh, let's see. I, I feel like Mike Francis. <laughs> he, he, he would fill... He would fill the time. Well, he wouldn't fill the time at all. It's like dead air. He's, he's dead air. So I guess I can give you a, 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 a preview of what's coming up here. And that is uh, Chris Childs is coming up Friday. And um, he's the former New York Knicks point guard. He'll be here 7 o'clock Friday, February 4th. Chris helped the Knicks to the finals in 1999. Next week should be a good show. I got special agent Miles Son coming up. Uh, thanks to Bob Starkman, who's been get me in touch with all these great guys. Miles will be here. February 8th, for those of you that live locally in New York, Alice Gaynor will be here as well. Uh, Alice Gaynor, a Emmy Award winning anchor here in New York. Hang on. Hold the phone, folks. Mr. Borelli, uh, the, the viewers are waiting for your arrival. Uh, Mr. Uh, these, the viewers are waiting for your arrival, sir. Um, on the phone right now, Mr. Borelli, as a matter of fact, folks. Um, yeah, the show went live at six o'clock. I'm here winging it right now, but the audience is waiting for you to pop up on my screen. You got the link? That's all right. It's all right. In the meantime here, don't mind me. I'll just be talking to the audience. Uh, I have, I have my viewers here, so I'll keep them entertained and I'll wait for you to sign on. Um, uh, but that's okay. The, but <laughs> yeah, I just, well, I just sent it to you as a matter of fact, to your email. So it should pop up right there, that link and, uh, and you should click it. Joe Borelli, folks, uh, he is the the former NYPD chief of detectives, and he's going to tell me quite a few interesting stories tonight. <laughs> uh, apologies for the delay, but he'll be here. The point is, he's here. We'll, we'll, we'll be here shortly. So, no problem. For those of you that will listen to the audio version later, this first this first 15 minutes, I'm going to edit it out. You won't hear this. I'm just going to go straight into uh, my conversation with Joe. But YouTube, this is this is the benefit of live uh, podcasting, folks. You get to see me scramble uh, and metaphorically and maybe even literally pee my pants um, out of nervousness. But uh, that being said, uh, Joe Borelli is, is going to be the guest of honor here tonight. He'll be here in short order. And uh, we look forward to bringing him on. Bob Geis in the chat, retired NYPD detective, says he met Joe Borelli during the Baby Hope case in the 34th Precinct, which I'm sure you remember, Joe, uh, quite well. That's Bob Geis. You said that was Tony Giorgio? Come on. What's that? You said that was uh, who, Tony Giorgio, you said? Jerry Giorgio. Yeah. Yeah, that was Jerry Giorgio. Hmm. Uh, he wasn't the fellow who made the arrest, though. Jerry had just retired. I... Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating case. The NYPD has a podcast of its own in which they just did a uh, uh, just did a deep dive into it. Yeah, Bob Geis uh, confirms that Detective Geis says it was Jerry Giorgio who worked that case. Yep. Yeah. Joe Murray, a retired NYPD officer and criminal defense attorney and host of the Allegedly Guilty podcast. 
Uh, he's here tonight. Thank you. His better half, Angela Ang, retired out of the 13th precinct this year. Thanks, guys. Waiting for Mr. Brilliant to sign on. He'll be here shortly. Uh, so, uh, you know. So. But that being said, uh, be on the lookout for uh, the upcoming shows here that I have. Mm -hmm. The one that says StreamYard, sir. Nope, it said, it's going to say StreamYard at the very top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just type your name. Uh, what's it saying right now? Allow it just click it just just allow that yeah. Yep, just click on allow. It should say enter studio. Uh, you just got to type your name. Yes, yeah, it should say yeah, display display name. You can type in Joe Borelli, whatever you want. And then click enter studio. And here you are. I'm going to hang up. And ladies and gentlemen, here he is, live and in living color, after a hair-raising 18 minutes of me babbling about nothing, Joe Burrell. I'm sorry. I'm really am sorry. No, don't worry about it. It's okay. I was able to wing it here, and I had my chat friends helping me out. Uh, I might have lost at least two years, maybe five off my life, but that's okay. The point <laughs> is Welcome, Chief. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. So I was doing a little bit of the introduction for you and, and your career. You spent almost 40 years in the uh, That's the phone. Don't worry about that. Started in 57. You finished out in 96. Chief of detectives for a while, but obviously the most notable case of your career, one of the most notable cases is the Son of Sam case, which we'll get into as we go. But you're a Brooklyn kid originally. So take me through your early years. Early years. Uh I was, uh, when I graduated the academy, uh, it was interesting. Uh, they used, they gave out four awards. They gave out, uh, and it was all usually an off duty weapon. You get, they gave out one for the academic, highest academic average, the highest physical mark, the highest shooting mark. And then they gave one for overall. I was fortunate enough to win the overall which was the uh, highest general average of the four areas. Then I went to the 23rd Precinct, and then they started a new outfit called the Tactical Patrol Force. There's a bunch of fellas, 75 of us. You have left in two years on the job. You had to be over six feet tall. And the users is uh, to go around, whenever there was trouble, they would send the TPF and uh, we would, uh, Whatever the problem was, we would address the problem. And then I made sergeant and I naturally passed a few more tests and wound up chief of detectives after a few years. As we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, so, you know, you come from a military background as well. You were telling me about that off the air. Tell me about your years in the service. No, well, just um, I was drafted during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, at that time, uh, it was interesting. The, um, the service, when the, I took basic training in Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, which is southwest of New York. And when we got on the train to go to basic, we went north, up to the Canadian border, actually we were on that train for four days. We finally got to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. Hmm. And from there was, uh, basic training, 
and then uh, overseas, and then back again, and discharged. Hmm. So, just two years, and then I had to put eight years in the reserves. A lot of time, a lot of the time, especially in the police department and the fire department too, but more so the police department, they look at guys that come from that kind of background as very squared away. You know, because it's kind of the same environment, the police department, after all, and the fire department, too, is a paramilitary organization. So do you feel that kind of gave you a leg up in your career as a cop? Well, uh, yeah, it was semi-military. Everybody says that about police departments. So you're used to uh, following orders, doing what you're told, you know, and uh, looking for the backing of your people. You know, they have your back, whatever you're doing. So it's very similar. It's a very easily adapt to uh, the police department if you've been in the service. Hmm. So that early era, you know, I talked about it when I was uh, fighting for my life up here for for 20 minutes. And I was mentioning that the late 50s and the early 60s, I mean, yeah, things changed on a dime for the city, as you know, in the mid 60s and then into the 70s and into the 80s. But late 50s, early 60s was a relatively good time for the city. So Working back then, tell me about the kind of neighborhoods you were patrolling and the kind of guys that you were working with that taught you the job. The uh, actually, uh, it was the late fifties when I went on. Uh, I went on the job in fifty-seven. Yeah. So it was the uh, it, things didn't really heat up in the city until the sixties. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and then up until that time, uh, the basic thing that I went to was there was a uh, two planes collided over New York City, two uh, airliners. Right. And one landed in uh, Staten Island, which was in, the, was in a vacant lot or something. But one landed right in the middle of Brooklyn. And that was in 1960. And we were there for that. That was a, that was a pretty terrible situation. You know? But uh, there wasn't that much problem and that we saw later on in the 60s with the violence and the riots and all. Yeah, it wasn't, there wasn't that much of that at all in the, the late 50s. It didn't start until, I would say, uh, when Red, when Martin Luther King was, was assassinated, uh, that was probably the start of things in the city, you know, uh, with a lot of disruptive behavior. Chief Joe Varelli is our guest tonight on the Mike to Maven podcast. A quick shout out to the friends in the live chat who were helping me out and bearing with me here. Uh, Scotty Wagner, a detective uh, from the 3-2. Uh, well, not, not the 3-2, excuse me, from the 2-3 and hostage negotiation. Uh, he was on uh, the show before. He'll soon be on the show again. And he has a picture that he sent me, Stuff Scotty, of when I believe he got his gold shield from you. Remember him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Pictures like that, uh, you know, bring back memories. Right. Of course. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of memories in a 40-year career for you. Yeah. Mike, I have a little difficulty hearing. Would you repeat that? No, I said, you know, you have, uh, and there's a lot of memories in a 40-year career for you, for sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yes. Absolutely. Good. So, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say. Uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people think about the chief of detectives, but in my career, I've almost, almost divided 50-50. I was in uniform mm-hmm. and, and then uh, detectives, of course. But I spent a great deal of time in uniform. You know? mm-hmm. And it was, it was interesting to see both sides of the department. You, know, that you wore it one way in your entire career. And uh, when I used to engage in conversations with some of the bosses, in fact, the uh, police commissioner uh, at one time, they didn't have too much of a liking for detectives. I don't know, they kind of looked, if they came through the patrol force, then they kind of didn't like detectives. So we we used to have quite a few heated arguments (laughs) and about uh, what the role of detectives were in the department. And, uh, you know, so it, it, that brought back memories. Uh, you had Louis Animone on a mm-hmm. while ago, and uh, Louis worked for me 
when I was in uniform in the in the uh, street crime unit, to uh, citywide street crime unit. Louis was a, a very active detective up there, you know. And then later on, he became my boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way the department goes. Yeah, she was the chief of the department when he, when he got that role in 1995. Scotty says that was the award for the homicide course, I should say. I had held my shields for four years at the time. All right, Scotty, my bad on that one. That's the nerves getting the best of me. Uh, but that was, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting photos of you. I have a book here, Rendered Safe Tales of an NYPD Bomb Tech. Our friend Don Sadawi from the bomb squad after 93 bombing at the Trade Center. When he was getting bumped up to detective second grade, there's a photo, a great photo there of him with you. Uh, at the promotion ceremony so yeah well, when i when i when i said i was going to have you on the show a lot of the guys and the and the gals who were working under you uh when you were headed heading to the detective bureau all remembered you and they're saying it tonight great cop great boss peter pranzo from the three two legendary lieutenant saying the same thing i don't know if you know pete at all no no i don't i don't, uh, I don't know lately i'm having a little difficulty it must be my age you know remembering things and all but um I to hear things like that, that uh, you know, uh, when I look back at it, they're a great bunch of guys and women that we had in the, in the detective bureau. And in fact, the entire police department, all the years I spent that, no regrets, no, not one regret. Uh, my wife used to marvel. I'd be in the morning getting shaved. Said, How can you be so happy? Yes, because I'm going to the best job in the world. <laughs> And that's what I, that's how I thought of it. Absolutely. I gave it a roll and uh, <clears throat> we came back to help me 100%. Of course, of course, as we'll dive deeper into tonight. So, you know, when you were an investigator, before you eventually took over the role of running a squad yourself as a sergeant and later on a lieutenant, um, as an investigator on the street, you're often looking to the detectives that are seasoned that have been on the street, that have handled their fair share of cases, even if they're not necessarily headline grabbing cases, they've handled their fair share until they know how to work them. And it's really by learning from them that one hones their own skills and becomes a good investigator on their own right. So when you look back on that time in your career, who are the guys looking back that you would say, yeah, that guy or even that gal taught me how to be a good detective? Yeah, I, I would, there was a, a great lieutenant by the name of Dan Kelly. And the, uh, if competence was a virtue, Danny was a saint. <laughs> I mean, uh, whenever there was things around, I wanted to be with Dan Kelly. You know, either when they, when I, uh, I remember the Howard Beach case. Uh, we had a problem that night, and we had been going all thirty-six hours. Danny was off. When he came back, you know, it was like a light was coming into the tunnel. Of course, I had a great feeling that uh, we were going to put everything together, and we did. And so going back, there were others, many others, but uh, my best memories would be of Danny, you know, learning from him, watching him operate, you know, giving him a free reign, and... Uh, getting the results, always got the results that were necessary. Um, there were others, many others too. Uh, but uh, remember in the 40s, the, uh, the Army had a football team up at West Point and they had two guys, they called them Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. It was Doc Blanchard and I think the, the outside man was Davis. And one would hit the line running and the other one would run outside. Well, I had a Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside when I was in Queens Detectives. Uh, Dan Kelly was the Mr. Inside and I had a sergeant by the name of Philly Panzarello who was a Mr. Outside. And whenever we had a, uh, an involved case or something, a heated case, uh, Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside took care of everything. Uh, and, uh, yeah, great. Uh, they're both gone now, but uh, they were a great team. And those are the gumshoe guys, you know, out on the street. That's that's the old, and it still goes on today. But you know, back then, what's what I marvel at 
in detective bureau and really any kind of investigator because even as a patrol cop you're doing some form of investigation it's not as deeply as the detective bureau does but you're out there to an extent is you don't have this you know they have phones now they have laptops and all different forms of technology that has made the job so much easier to do and good the easier we can make it for them the better so that they can have a, a less of a hard time catching bad guys but back then there was none of that we were and it's not like oh technology was just starting up like in the 80s and the 90s so we had an early version of it 50 60 70 none of this stuff existed so you were really working this you were working your mind and you're working the street and working sources to where some of the smartest and best cops that i think the nypd uh has had through the years and this is no disrespect to the other eras because every era produces its own fair share of legends yeah. but they come from that era the 50s and 60s and 70s that was yeah. even though the city was in a bad shape you know in the late 60s early 70s yeah. tell me if you agree that was the golden era in terms of yeah. cops well things were as you said they were so different uh, today with the telephones and all when you turned out in the 50s and you went on your post the only communication you had with the station house was a call box and they were located on the street uh, not every corner had one they were on a post and uh, you may not even be on your post you'd have to walk down four or five blocks to make a call to bring into the station house and all and what disturbs me is when i hear when i see people uh in it, certain areas that they say they dislike the police uh i don't buy that i mean i've worked in some tough areas in the in the early 50s and has problems on the street and never never did i not get a response from the radio cars you could hear them coming so that tells me somebody in that community called in that there was a cop in trouble and these were the areas now that they claim people dislike cops now even today they don't dislike they want more of them certain elements for their own benefit they go around and telling people about things that the police do and maybe some situations occur yeah there were unfortunate things happen but i'll never forget those days uh, one really bad situation and uh, i faced and somebody called and there come the radio cars to help me you know and that was you didn't have a telephone all you had was a call box yep and those were tough days but and the police commission that time was steve kennedy uh, when you graduated the academy everybody graduated went to certain particular areas of the city high crime areas where you learn the job you learned it very quickly uh because all the experienced guys were there and then you didn't move on to a lighter precinct or so go out to queens or staten island much later in your career you had to put those early years in the uh, in the high crime areas in the city and you became you became a uh, very knowledgeable and become good cops. You know, and that's what I think about it. it Maybe old fashioned thinking that way, but that's what I, I so. do. No, I don't think so. I think you're dead on because again, you want them to see early on how to handle certain situations, and it's not really trial by fire as much as it is an honest look at what you're going to have to do you're not in walla walla washington you're not in a, a town of, of 50 people in which things could still happen but not to the extent that it happens in larger cities of course even down where i'm at new haven connecticut we're not as busy as you guys in new york city but there's a there's a significant elements of calls that the police department gets and there are certain neighborhoods in this city that you're going to get a lot of action uh so that's the best to really sharpen up the skill set uh of the guys and the gals that are coming on the job so you mentioned of course taking tests and ascending the ranks early on or earlier i should say you know becoming a sergeant becoming a lieutenant later on having your own squads a lot of guys and gals want to be bosses when they come on they have those goals some of them don't some of them are content staying just where they are and that's fine as long as you do good work it doesn't matter what appealed to you about ascending through the ranks you know uh 
I wish I could say, you know, uh, some altruistic idea, mm. but the fact of making a few extra dollars in your payroll, you know, your paycheck <laughs> was not was a pretty good initiation. Uh, and then once you, once you pass that sergeant's test, you know, you say, well, I could do it again, you know, and that's kind of like an incentive to go on. And the one thing I always used to tell everybody, don't get too comfortable where you are. Because once you get comfortable, you don't, then you lose your desire to look ahead, you know, or, or try to get promoted and all that kind of stuff. I'll never forget, I had, um, when I was in the academy, I had a friend of mine, uh, one guy that was in the school with me, he, he was studying for the sergeant's test in the academy. And uh, because he told me, Joe, he said, this is a boss's job. You got to get promoted. You got to get promoted. Well, he uh, had a part-time job in a, in a stable in Brooklyn, you know, horseback riding. Mm-hmm. And um, if, uh, somebody there was a high-ranking member of the police department and got him into the, uh, the horses, you know, the mounted unit. Well, years later, I think Al retired from the mounted unit. He found his niche and he never wanted to go beyond that. So uh, I always said, uh, I never sought to find my comfortable spot. <clears throat> I would, I would go wherever they sent me and I wouldn't look for uh, to be, except uh, maybe I always look to come back to the bureau whenever I, whenever they put me back in uniform. You know? But uh, that's what I would tell the youngsters. You know, don't get too comfortable in what you're doing, you know, but that's what I, that's what my incentive was. Uh, Probably uh, when I started, when we were married and I had a couple of children and things were a little harder then, yeah, getting promoted was a nice way of uh, easing some of the burdens. Oh, for sure. For sure. Bob Geist, the retired detective, uh, second grade, he has a question for you. You covered where you grew up earlier. You mentioned you grew up in Brooklyn. But uh, what he wants to know is uh, what high school did you go to and what jobs did you have before the military? If any. Um, I went to manual training high school. I, it was on 7th Avenue and 4th Street. No, yeah, oh, that was, yeah, 7th Avenue and four, around 4th Street. Uh, when um, I got signed to uh, the New York Giants, it was uh, signed me to a professional baseball contract wow. and right out of high school. And I played, uh, I started in Bristol. Virginia, the Appalach- the old Appalachian League. And when I would come home, uh, my father w- was a, uh, he said, you know, his dictate was learn to trade and never use it. That's what he told me. So uh, I got an opportunity. I, I became a member of the Bricklayers Union. And so during the winter months, I would, I would lay bricks. And I did that for two years. And... Then when I come in out of the army, I, I would hurt my arm in the army, so I couldn't play ball anymore. And uh, so to answer uh, the question, uh, the jobs I had, I was a bricklayer, a, a baseball player that, uh, well, I guess I was pretty good. Who the hell knows? I'm not sure. But, uh, but I enjoyed that. And then... Uh, and then the bricklayer, and then the police department. I wonder what it would be like now, because back then, of course, for those of you that may not know, the New York Giants, he's not talking about the football Giants. He's talking about what is now the San Francisco Giants, uh, who moved yeah. from New York out to San Fran, I think in the early 60s. Because we, for, for if you don't follow baseball, we used to have more than just the Yankees and the Mets in New York. We had the Brooklyn Dodgers, who are now the Los Angeles Dodgers, and, of course, as he just said, the Giants. So, Man, if we had four teams all in one spot today, mm-hmm. I wonder what, especially now with, you know, how much sports media there is, the coverage of yeah. these teams would be insane. Insane. That'd be great. That'd be great. And you still got pockets of Dodgers fans in Brooklyn. Yeah. 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 
The Cyclones, right? Is that what they call? We had the yeah, the Mets double A affiliate is the Cyclones now. But you know, if you you have a, a, a bunch of kids that are growing up and they they root for the Dodgers, they live out in that area because why? Well, their grandparents or their great grandparents were Brooklyn original Brooklyn Dodgers fans, and so right. there's still pockets. You know, when you got Giants fans here too, so there's pockets. So when you became a Commander, you know, I, I always ask this question to the guys that become bosses because now you're looking out for these guys that are working under you. And on top of that, they're looking towards you, not just as their boss, but as ultimately as an example. And we've heard the stories from both the FDNY and the NYPD of great bosses and not so great bosses. Maybe they weren't, you know, bad people, but they just weren't fit for that role. So for you realizing, yeah, they're looking at me for leadership. I better put on a good example. I better show them what we are to do and what we shouldn't do. What was the key for you in being a good commander, especially with the examples you cited earlier and Phil Panzarella, a sergeant, and Dan Kelly, a lieutenant? When, as a, as a boss in the police department, you, you know, you kind of lead by uh, doing, you do what you want them to do. You know? Right. So that that's one thing. But when you're judging them, like if they, they messed up a little wrong or they did something wrong, I always used to ask myself one question. I'd say to myself, did he make a mistake of the mind or did he make a mistake of the heart? And the difference being, anybody can make a mistake of the mind. You didn't know a procedure, you didn't know a particular part of the law and you messed up. That's one thing. You treat that guy in one way. But if he made a mistake of the heart where down deep he knew what he was doing was wrong, then you got to treat that guy a lot differently. And I think throughout my career, when, uh, when I became a boss, I always kept that in mind. You don't treat everybody the same. You got to take into consideration what they did and how they did it. And that's where the mistakes of the mind and the mistakes of the heart, that was my philosophy. And I carried that all the way through Right up until the day I retire. It's easy to forgive an honest mistake because nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10, I should say, when somebody makes an honest mistake, the intention was pure. They weren't acting in bad faith. They were acting in good faith. They just, you know, they got tripped up procedurally. But as you said, when somebody knows what they're doing isn't the right thing and they take that gamble, knowing full well the, what the consequences are, well, then it, you don't have any sympathy for that person. You knew what you did. No. Right. That's the way. That's the way it went, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you can you can make mistakes. You can get yourself in trouble, you know, unintentionally. I, I, how many times I found myself? Uh, for, yeah, one big time uh, was uh, during the Howard Beach case. Mm -hmm. One of one of the detectives we had we had the the guys. That, all around there, there must have been 20 uh, individual youngsters in there, and detectives were with them and all. And uh, the kid that led was kind of like the ringleader. His name was John Lester. He all of a sudden started blading out, and the detective that was guarding him it took everything down, like an ex uh, took the statement, whatever he was saying, took it down. All of a sudden, uh, I get called down to the police commissioner's office because the <clears> deputy <throat> commissioner of legal matters, and they're concerned about this statement that this detective took. So, well, he, he got liable to get thrown out and all that. So I went back at them pretty heavy. In fact, the police commissioner remarked when I left, he says, you've got one big bear, he said, you know, because the way uh, I was defending the detective. I said, hey, it's not for you to make the judgment. A judge will make that judge in court whether he took that statement correctly or legally or whatever you want to call it. You know? So you got to back your guys. Uh, <laughs> I remember one detective told me, he said, gee, I, you know, I don't mind. I want you to back me when I'm right, but could you do it when I'm a little wrong too? You know? <laughs> so I, I always remember that, you know. So there were some funny, some really nice, funny remarks that were made through the years. No, of course. 
And of course, uh, former chief of detectives Joe Borelli is our guest tonight on the Mike Dinohaven podcast. You know, it's interesting in that when you look at a command, it's really a platoon. We talked about the NYPD being a uh, paramilitary organization earlier. It's a platoon. And when they're looking, you know, at their sergeant or at their lieutenant or at their captain, if they see it, the guy kind of cowers when the boss is above him come down on him they're gonna you know they're gonna be loyal to their own interest and as a result you don't have cohesiveness you have the polar opposite you have disarray but when they see that it's a loyal boss who will fight for his guys through thick and thin and even when they mess up a little bit he'll be there on the front lines for him and won't abandon them you have a bond that really can't be broken it's the strongest chain imaginable yeah that's true yeah you know, um you don't intensely work out that way. I mean, if that if you, a lot of people aren't built that way, and then there are others. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'll tell you a funny story about the backing of people. There was a situation on Columbia University where the students had taken over the buildings and all, and it was uh, it was a mess, and there was a confrontations all over the place between the the police and the students, you know, and later on there was civilian complaint. There were everything. Uh, internal affairs that later became the chief of department, Bob Johnson Jr. Yep. Uh, he was a captain in internal affairs and Eddie Dreyer, deputy chief Eddie Dreyer was a friend, a neighbor of mine, you know, and I was a sergeant in the TPF. So I get notified, I have to report to internal affairs. I go down and there's another sergeant waiting out there, the two of us from the TPF. So now it's my turn to go in. Well, I went in first and Captain Johnson, you know, got a big map of uh, Columbia University with marks all over it. And uh, he said, uh, I said, I don't know why I'm here. Why am I here? He said, uh, a newspaper man was beaten by a police officer. Really? Uh, or he was struck with a nightstick or whatever it was. And uh, I said, yeah, where did it happen? He says, "At the map, in front of the mathematics building. So I said, where's that? I said, and he turns around to the map and he's pointing toward the mathematics building. And he says, now, where were you on that? I said, and I pointed to the opposite side of the map. I said, I was on the other side of the map. So he looked at me and he says, you know, I could read his mind. He made a mistake by pointing where the incident occurred and he let me show me where I was. So, <laughs> and years, I'm talking about years later. He's now a full inspector and, he's, and uh, I'm a captain and we're in the bureau and there's a, he had just come and I'm walking into his office. I forget what the writer. And he looked at me and he says, Sergeant and TPF, he remembered me. I said, oh gee, here I am. I'm dead in the water now. <laughs> I got the guy, my my dep, my inspector now knows and he, and he dislikes me. Turns out it was all wrong. We laughed at it and we, we had a good talk about it. That's good. No, I love those little stories, and I'm glad that you added that. Any other stories that may come to mind, go ahead and throw them out there because, you know, this is a this is a look back at a bygone era. You know, it's a lot different now. A lot of things have changed, some for the better, not some not so much. But it's the little wrinkles like this, which is why I love bringing you guys on and, and getting so many of these great stories. Now, I want to segue into the Son of Sam case. But before I get to that, just to establish kind of a surface thing here, you had Queen's Homicide underneath your command for a while. And I mentioned earlier things really getting bad in the city in the 70s and in the into the 80s into the early 90s. But there were still areas that were peaceable, that were good, that really didn't feel the brunt of the impact of the rise in crime. Did Queens, were you, was your command one that was especially busy at the time or was it relatively quiet on the homicide front, at least before Berkowitz? Yeah, no, Queens was always quiet on the homicide front. We, we, uh, but the, the most active precinct in those days probably was the 103. The 103, uh, you had the most crime and all. Uh, but Queens was relatively quiet uh, uh, during that time. But 
the way uh, Eddie Dreyer was the uh, chief, and the way he had Queens broken up, there were three captains out there. Uh, one captain, they had an outfit uh, called Miraquick. It was kind of like the, the forerunner of the uh, of the uh, the manner in which they uh, identify prisoners now, uh, people nowadays with the uh, computers. You know, Danny Danny O'Brien ran that Miraquick, and it was it was crude. It was, but it was a start, and. There was a fly captain, and then there was a captain in charge of the three homicide squads, the uh, 15th, the 16th, and the 17th squads. They were, uh, so there was a fly captain, captain in charge on homicides, and Danny. And I, and I was the uh, captain in charge of the three homicide squads uh, prior to uh, the uh, Son of Sam case, you know. Uh, but... You know, Queens, I would say, would be one of the quietest precincts. Even the Bronx, I think, had more homicides than we did. If we had a couple of hundred homicides in those days, that was a lot. When the rest of the city was Manhattan and Brooklyn, oh, they were experiencing a huge increases in homicides. They were, they were like off the wall, I think. One year, well, I think we wound up with over 2,000, didn't we, in the city? 1990. Yeah. Yeah. 2,700 plus. Yeah. Mm. I'm telling you, it was murder. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the way it was. Queens was fairly quiet, you know? Mm -hmm. The, uh, I guess, the 16th homicide would probably, the squad, would probably be the most active because that was the, uh, the 103 to 113. Uh, in those precincts, you know, the uh, the fifteenth was really quiet. Sixteenth was pretty uh, very quiet. So it was just the sixteenth homicide that really where all the action was. So that brings us to Mr. Berkowitz's reign of terror. He was mentally ill, and back then we don't have the we didn't have the resources that we have now to treat mentally ill people. It was a lot different. And instead of him wandering around, not bothering anybody, maybe scaring people a little bit, you know, but wandering like you see some EDPs, but they don't harm anybody. They just keep to themselves and you keep away. He had a firearm um, and he subsequently used that firearm to target a very specific group of people, young couples, lovebirds, if you will. Right. When did you start to realize which homicide was it in the string that he committed? And you kind of started to sense we have a pattern here. It was uh, Christine Freund. She was murdered uh, sitting in a car with her boyfriend in Forest Hills. Uh, I responded. It was uh, was close to midnight, and we responded. And you have to another thing that people weren't aware of. Uh, we had a police commissioner who totally disliked detectives, so he broke up the detective bureau. Uh, they had what they call precinct squads. Well, I mean, we always had precinct squads, but he took the precinct squads and had them under the uniform commander. The precinct commander had his own detective squad. And the chief of detectives at that time had borough squads, robbery, burglary, larceny, homicide, and special victims. Or in those days, it was called the sex crime squads. Uh, so... I responded, uh, and the night watch, the detective night watch responded. And the precinct had a uh, night watch also. Right. And they responded also. So we were at the scene, and in the windshield was an expanded round. It was a big hunk of lead. And they, Christine Foyne had survived the first few hours, and she was... Well, she was in the hospital, and now we're back at the scene. And we're looking at that hunk of lead, and I said, boy, that's an awful big book. Danny Kelly was with me. And, I, yeah. And I forget this, uh, the detective's name from the precinct who come to me as I'm talking, but he was the precinct squad. He said, you know, we had a shooting uh, a while ago. He said, and there was a big bullet used. It was a 44 caliber. I said, really? 
He said, yeah. And then uh, we found out there was a shooting up in the Bronx. They had a homicide. Said, oh. So the next morning I had, uh, I called the chief of detective's office and I got permission to bring uh, the uh, Ronnie Marcenison and, and Paul, Richie Paul from the eighth homicide. They had caught a case, Donna Loria. She was shot with a 44. And of course, uh, the detective that had the case in the 105. And we're sitting there and I had just gotten a new sergeant, Joe Coffey. Joe, <laughs> Joe Coffey came from the chief of detectives office. And I told him, I said, hey, Joe, you sit in the back and you just take notes. And uh, we started talking about the cases. So it turns out we had the homicide in the, uh, up in the Bronx with the fourth war. And there were two shootings in the, in the Queens that no homicide, but the, the, the girls were wounded. One girl was wounded. And one of the, uh, the shoot victims of the shooting was a detective's daughter, Rosemary, uh, I forget what her name, Keenan, uh, Redmond Keenan, I think was her name. Well, anyway, it was his daughter. So now, after, the, after it's all over, I go to my boss, who was, uh, who became the chief of detective too. Uh, and I told him, I said, uh, Dick Nicastro, I say, inspector, I said, it looks like this could be something involved here. I said, we got a homicide in the Bronx. Ballistic says there are 44 caliber bullets, but he can't mark them. He said, they're, they're destroyed. He can't compare them or match them. I said, but I don't know, it's strange. He says, all right, so he says, take a couple of guys. He says, uh, I said, how about, can I get those guys from the Bronx, put together a few, and maybe we start looking at it? So he called, he got permission. And so they, we had Ronnie and uh, Richie Paul assigned in Queens, and we started working on our case. And then uh, it went from there. That was the start of it. And then as, as each case came in, you know, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, I think it was the Virginia Vascarician case, young girl, uh, where we were able to match the bullets. But the way they did it was, uh, they didn't have all three striations on the bullets. One bullet matched a fraction of one bullet, and that bullet matched the third bullet. And I think they, in philosophy, if A, B, and C, if A and B are the same, and A and C are the same, A, B, and C, well, however it worked, we finally determined that it was one gun being used, you know, and uh, that was right after Virginia Vascarici was killed. And, uh, the story that no one has ever, I never told it to anybody. Would you like to hear it first? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, Right after, was right uh, after the Vascarician homicide. I'm in the office and the phone rings and, they, uh, and I hear a Hispanic man is talking to me and I hear a woman in the background and she's speaking Spanish. And he said, don't hang up, he says. And he goes on to tell me his wife has these powers and all that kind of stuff. So I'm taking notes and uh, he uh She's telling me, uh, or he's telling me, she's, he's translating it for me. He's going to hit again. He's going to strike again. Uh, you, uh, he's going to talk to you. Uh, he's going to kill a man and a woman. It's going to be on a street, not a street. They're going to be sitting in a car. The car is black and red. And it's a... a Kills both of a male and a female. I said, okay. Oh, now it's something to me. What, it was just before the Vasca reaching an homicide. So I, I write it all down. I go out and I talk to the judge. I just got off the phone, oh, blah, 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 blah. So shortly thereafter, Virginia Vasca reaching gets killed. Now she's a young girl walking on the street on Dartmouth Street. He shoots her right, right in the lip. 
and she's DOA at the scene, you know. So uh, we respond, and I'll never forget one of the detectives, I forget his name, he looked up at me and says, boy, it looks like that woman was wrong. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, well, a little while later, months later, I'm home at night. I get a call from Joe Coffey, who was working uh, late. He, his team uh, worked all, all night long. You know, they worked, uh, they came in at 10 and they worked till six in the morning to cover the, the everything. So we had 24 hour coverage. So he calls me at the house. He says, we can hear it again. It's up in the Bronx. I said, okay, so I, 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 I shoot up to the Bronx. And where is it? It's on the service road of the Hutchinson River Parkway, which is a street and it's not a street, right? The service road. The car is black and red. The male and female, that's Suriani and Isu, they're both killed. At that scene, there was a letter addressed to me. So, I mean, I'm now I'm thinking about the phone call I got from this woman. And I'll I'll give her a name, a Mrs. Rodriguez, but that's not a name. But anyway, it was remarkable how she had foreseen this and and all. So the first thing I did was when I got back, I reached out. I had the phone number from her husband. I said, can I meet with you and your wife? And she said, of course. Yeah. So I had made a copy of the letter that was left at the scene addressed to me. I had it in my pot. In my, uh, so I picked up her and her husband and talking to her. And I said, can you tell me anything about this? And I handed her a copy of the letter that was addressed to me. She, it's in an envelope now folded. She feels it and she says, this is to you. And I said, oh man, you know, now, can you tell me the name of the killer? You know, the, that, that's how she would. So I took her, I took it to the scene of the point homicide. And she was kind of fuzzy there. She didn't know, but then a hundred yards away is where Christine uh, Boscarichin was killed. So I bring her over there, and as she's walking, she stops in front of this house, and she says, something terrible happened in that house. And she said, the person who, the person that uh, is, has trouble walking, there was a homicide in that house, and the suspect, although we never proved it, he had an amputated his, uh, his foot, so he was on crutches. So now I'm, you know, now I'm saying this one. But uh, I got in a little trouble over her, too, because I had given her my word that uh, no matter what, uh, I would be the only person dealing with her. I wouldn't reveal her name. I wouldn't do any of that. And I gave her my word. Then the Bronx got wind of uh, this woman that was supposed to be uh, going to tell us who the killer was. And they wanted to talk to her. And I said, then no, I, you can't talk to her, I said, Whatever you want to know, give it to me and I'll translate it. I'll give it to her. But I promised her I wouldn't give her up. And that got as far as the police commissioner uh, that I was resisting, you know. But it turned out my card was the police commissioner. And he was my former boss in the tactical patrol force. So he called me. He said, Joe, what's wrong? I said, why don't you? I said, I told him. I said, look, I gave him my word. I said, I can't go back on my word. I said, I would anything they want to know, I'll get it from her. I'll go give me the questions or whatever. But I can't give her up, you know. So he agreed with me, and I, that was the end of that. But she never did get beyond that point. But I mean, even thinking about it now, I get goosebumps because she was so right on the money with everything. And uh, even a letter to me, she said, he's going to talk to you. Jeez. thinking about it. Man. So you got a first. <laughs> that's that is what we call a Mike in New Haven exclusive. 
That's the yeah. name of the show, of course. That is an exclusive, and I'm very honored that you chose to share that with me, of all people. So for all my crime reporter friends out there, I got it first. Ha -ha. Yeah. <laughs> but to your point earlier, the last name was Keenan, uh, one of the victims that survived, but her yeah. father was on the job. It says here is De Niro and Keenan in, in October of 1976. It says on October 23rd, 1976, a similar shooting occurred in a secluded residential area of Flushing, Queens, next to Bone Park. Carl yeah. De Niro, a city bank. She was sitting in a Volkswagen, and uh, she was driving. Yep. And her boyfriend, I guess it was her boyfriend, mm -hmm. was the, the one who was injured. Uh, she didn't. Uh, she wasn't injured at all. Yep. It says uh, police determined that the bullets embedded in Keenan's car were a 44 caliber, and they were so deformed, though, that they thought it, it it was unlikely that they could ever be linked to a particular weapon. De Niro had shoulder length hair, and police letters speculated the shooter had mistaken him for a woman. Keenan's father was a 20-year veteran police detective of the NYPD right. causing an intense investigation. Uh, so the letter that was addressed to you reads as followed, and this is just a particular quote from it. Quote, Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill anymore. No, sir. No more, but I must honor thy father. End quote. When you read that, talk about goosebumps. You're getting an insight into yeah. a maniac's mind. He's a madman. Right. When you, you first know, heard uh, that, what'd you think? Yeah, uh, well... I, you know, I, I took it kind of matter of factly, but the detect I didn't know this till later. Marlon Hopkins told me. Uh, my boss, uh, Dick Nicastro, who became the chief of detectives later on, he said, Joe, what do you think with the letter? Uh, was it threatening? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Well, what the detectives did, and then I'm at a retirement party much, much later. I don't know. Everybody retired. I was retired and all, and I meet some of the Marlon Hopkins and all, and they said when they when they read that letter, they thought it was a threat to me. He said, so they started tailing me home. I said, no. I said, yeah, no. They said, yeah, we followed you home. And you never followed me home. I said, because I used to square the block. Because I, I when everybody started telling me about it was a threat, I said, well, maybe there's something to it. Huh? So you know what square on the block is, right? Uh, make, it, for the listeners to explain it. You make four left-hand turns. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's following you and he's still behind you after the last left turn, then you know you're being followed. Right. Because you know? he's going the same way you are. Mm -hmm. So I said, I used to square the block. They said, yeah, we know that. But we know where you were going. So we would pick you up halfway home. I said, oh. so, you know, they had me. They really, I thought I was being cute, but they were being cuter, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, they, everybody thought it might be threatening. I didn't, I didn't really think so, but when they started saying, you know, it sound, looks like a threat. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it, and that, that was a, uh, you were living out in Long Island at the time in Limbrook. I mean, that, this is a time in which there was a great panic in the city because it's one thing to have the, I mean, I'm not dismissing it, the common street violence where thugs are fighting it out. And they call those public service homicides when gangsters and drug dealers are shooting and killing each other. But on top of that, now you have somebody who's mentally unstable with a firearm that's going around and targeting, even though he's looking at young people particularly, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you could easily become a victim in your own right. So when the public is so anxious and the press wants to know, and the bosses want to know. And here you are as a commander trying to run a smooth investigation. How difficult was that for you? Uh, it was up until a point, you know, uh, eventually uh, it got to a point where uh, Bronx, well, well, it was right after uh, the incident with the, uh, with the uh, Hispanic woman. Uh, you know, Bronx was, clamoring for this and all. So I get a call from the chief of detectives saying that uh, we're going to put uh, Timothy and uh, he's going to take over, Joe, but you got to stay as the exec. So Timothy come out, Dowd, Tim Dowd, mm -hmm. come out as the uh, deputy inspector. He was from Manhattan. So he that was the choice. But they put a, a guy from Manhattan so to keep the Bronx and Queens from fighting with one. Well, we weren't fighting, but they were kind of, uh, they were a little upset, the Bronx. I think because of her, uh, wouldn't let them talk to Mrs. Rodriguez. But anyway, uh, 
the stress, I, don't, I didn't think about stress at all while it was gone. Everything hit after it was all over. Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of things that physically went wrong with me and all. But during the time, uh, you know, you, you're just so involved. And uh, my, my job, basically what I would do is, uh, if we div- I divided the, uh, I, well, we, I called it the three eyes in the investigation. And we had three files. One was named immediate. The second file was important. And the third file was ignore. And that was the way we divided the information that was coming into the office, you know? So when I would come in, I was working maybe 14, 16 hours with no problem in those days, every day. I went from, uh, I went from April to uh, June without a day off. But anyway, we were, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily look in the uh, important and the immediate because I assumed, hey, that's what these guys are here for. That's what. So I would concentrate on the ignore. I figured I didn't want anything in that ignore folder to be of importance because I knew everything that had transpired in the investigation up to that point. So if anything came in there that would trigger me, that, hey, wait a minute, this could be that, well, we had a car, or we had some, what about what that person said? Well, I knew all that, you know, it was in my mind. So that's what I concentrated on, the ignore. And the, uh, when, when, she, when Stacey Moskowitz <clears throat> was killed, I went to Brooklyn, and they, they had decided because of everything that was going on at the task force, I mean, hundreds of calls coming in, they said they, and it was a good decision they made, leave Brooklyn detectives, let them run the, uh, the Moskowitz homicide. <clears throat> Excuse me. No problem. And they sent me there because, you know, I, I could fill them in on everything I'd gone. And that's what I, so I worked in uh, Brooklyn during the Moskowitz homicide. When, when they, when they went up to, uh, to get Yonkers, to get the, you know, the, where the arrest was made, I was in Brooklyn and uh, I had just come into work. I had been off and they told me that they were up and they had a, a lead and they were up in Brook, uh, up in Yonkers. Oh, that's great. How's it look? It looks good and all that. I, I called uh, the, uh, cause now, they called back and they said, we got our guy. And, they, and I got the information. So I immediately called the task force. And in those days, there was no computers, nothing. In fact, we'd have probably had them a lot sooner if we had the system now with the fingerprint identification. Right. Because we had the partials on the letter that was to me. But you couldn't you couldn't give the uh, fingerprint section uh, a a, you could give them a partial, but you had to name the suspect, and they would pull his card and compare the partial. Nowadays, you put the partial into the computer, and boom, within seconds, they give you the guy. So if we had had that ability, we would have had him right after Vascarici when, when the, uh, they developed the prints on my letter. But anyway, I made that call to the, the 109 to the 10th, and I said, look up the... Uh, I said, name is Berkowitz. Well, I said, see if we got anything on him. Did we pass him over? So they, they called me back in a little while and I said, no, we didn't have him. But there's a guy in the office right now, his name is Sam Carr. And he's telling us about this guy Berkowitz off in Yonkers who shot his dog. So that was a great relief to me. In other words, if we hadn't gotten the lead in Brooklyn with the summons and, and done that, we would have we would have had him when Carr came to the task force office and was telling us about this crazy guy up in the Bronx that shot his dog. I was Berkowitz. You know? 
So uh, it was good to know we either got them one way or the other. But uh, hopefully it would, it would have been a little difficult because he, when they grabbed him, he allegedly said that he was on his way out to the island. He was going to do some, going to do something out there on the island. So I'm glad we grabbed them when we did. Yeah. Looking back, all yeah. these years later, you know this is well. I want to say it's about it's going to be 45 years this year since his arrest in 1977. A lot has been made. Unfortunately, what happens is that when these serial killers strike. Yes, they're arrested, then they're convicted, then they're jailed. But there's this fascination with not, it, it, maybe it's not trying to glorify them, but giving them attention through these documentaries and through these podcasts, which I understand from a historical perspective, but it really doesn't serve a purpose for me because, and I think a lot of people feel the same way, because this is what they want. You know, they have nothing else. They're in prison. They're rotting away forever. And yet this is one more moment of gratification. It's almost like killing these victims all over again yeah. by dredging this stuff up. So when you see the documentaries made about him and now the theory that's going around that he didn't act alone, as somebody that worked this case so doggedly as you did and the detectives that worked equally doggedly under you, how does that make you feel? You know, uh, that's been around a while, you know, about that he acted alone or he didn't act alone. He was a cult. Uh, there was a the reporter that started that, or I think he even wrote a book, Maury Terry. Mm -hmm. that well, yeah. he was the one who started it all about that he didn't act alone. Uh, so what happened uh, when I uh, right, I got promoted to deputy inspector after that case. Tell you a funny story there. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. Go ahead. They, they sent, I, I was a deputy inspector and they sent me to the intelligence division. And I would, they gave me the uh, public security section, which is the unit that safeguards all the dignitaries and all that dignitary threat assessments. All. So I went there my first day there, I walked in and there were three, three guys that I worked with in the TPF. We were cops together. They were detectives now and they were in the public security section. It was uh, Jerry McCarthy, Walter Kirby, Bob Flanagan. And then as I'm walking down the aisle, I'm seeing all the names of the detectives there. There's Flynn, McCaffrey, you know. So I told the secretary, I want a squad meeting in 10 minutes. So she the squad meeting, I looked around, I said, you know that top of the morning stuff? That's out. I said, from now on, it's Bon Giorno. <laughs> you know, so then years later, I was the chief of detectives. I went to the intelligence division and I'm passing by the public security and I walked in and there were two old timers in there and they said, Bon Giorno, chief, how are you? <laughs> they remembered my thing. But anyway, yeah, well, that was a story. You're bringing up memories now. I, I haven't thought about them in a long, long time. I'm glad that we're reliving them. Yeah. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> Well, you know, but uh, what was I, I was going to, before I rudely interrupted you, what was it how we were talking about? No, we were talking about, I guess, the fact that these documentaries are being made and these podcasts oh. about him and all these years later, you know, the theory, of course, that he didn't act alone. So when you see him getting this attention, yeah. you know, it's died down now. But when you see these true crime things being made about people like him, how does that make you feel as somebody who was there and investigated these cases? Yeah. I mean, uh they, uh, one time they asked me, I said, what do you think about him? Did he act alone at all? I said, look, we had him for 14 hours. I said, he was interviewed and interrogated by some of the best detectives this world has ever seen. I said, and they came away with, I said, I, that was a big question. Did he act alone? You know, and you can't fool these guys. They come back, they said, nah. He knew too much about it. No, no way. The uh, the psychiatrist, the court appointed psychiatrist that uh, had him for a month. Uh, was it, I, I got to know the fellow, but I can't think of his name right now. 
I asked him, I said, look, without betraying any of this, uh, this is about, you know, doctor patient relationship. I said, the big thing is, did he act alone? Can you just answer that one question for me? He said, definitely acted alone. Now, this is a psychiatrist who had him for a month in the in the hospital in Brooklyn. The uh, experienced some of the best detectives you will ever know had this guy for 14, 14 hours and went going at him. And they came away with the fact. He never once mentioned anything that would lead you to believe other than that he did it other than himself, right? But this Maury Terry started writing. He said, there's a cemetery that the cult uses up in the Yonkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found that cemetery. It was a pet cemetery. People would, pets would die. Yeah, it was right off the, uh, one of the parkways up there, the Merrick Parkway or something. And they would bury their animals, cats and dogs. We dug up a couple of spots and there we never there was no humans. There was all animal bones. Right. The other thing was there was something to do out in uh, Minot, North Dakota, or South Dakota. There was a, a base out there with Sam Carr's son was in service out there. There was a cult out there. And investigators went out from John Santucci's office. They came back. And I called them. I said, what do you think? They nah, it's all baloney, you know, it's all made up stuff. Okay. So everything that uh, they claim he didn't act alone, they, the big thing was they put out uh, composites, drawings from the witnesses. Mm -hmm. I think there was at least six or seven. Uh, and if you looked at those, you say, what are you kidding me? There has to be more than one guy because they're, they didn't look at all. So I I never liked those at all because I knew, like the last one was uh, drawn by, uh, there was a fella in the car in front of uh, Stacy Matsubas and he was looking in the rear view mirror of his car because he was with his girlfriend in the front seat. And he's the one who drew the picture of this wild hair and all that. I said, what the hell kind of a look did he get at it? And I always said the only one who had anything accurate about Berkowitz was the Donna Lori homicide, Jody Valenti. Uh, yeah, I think she was a survivor. Now, she's only four feet away from him when he points the gun into the car. And she couldn't draw his face. But she had the shape of his head. And if you notice that when we locked him up, he had like, what do they call it? A widow's cap? Or, yep, I, widow's I peak. Hair, but, but she described that to a T. She had the shape of his head. She had the ears, but she couldn't put a face on it. The face that eventually was there was the artist. He filled it in on his own. So when we had him at the chief of detectives office, I made arrangements for her to look at a... Uh, 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 look at this. I'm have, don't get old. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we'll look at a, uh, a photo spread. You know, put six pictures together, and uh, we ha we had a Polaroid. You know, I don't know. It might have in today's court system. Maybe maybe it wasn't the right thing to do, but she she went right to him. And so I felt. And then I'm waiting to hear back from ballistics about the match of the gun. I'm waiting to we'll hear back from the uh, document section on the handwriting analysis. And uh, and I'm waiting to hear back from the fingerprints on the fingerprint identification. Because when I got all those results back, then I said, now I'm, now I'm absolutely certain we got our guy. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't care what anybody said. I, I was right there, you know, to tell them, hey, we got him. You know, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that this is the guy. But I waited until we had all that because uh, the mayor had uh, come up and he uh, he let us have a little party in the chief detective's office. And uh, 
And I, I didn't do any partying until I got the results of those four things. I wanted to be absolutely certain. You know? I didn't want, after all that time and all that energy and all that stress and all, I wanted to make sure we had the right guy. And you did. And that yeah. was that was incredible work. And, you know, and of course, we don't forget these victims 45 years later. They're still remembered. You know, and I think the important thing is to remember not how they died, but how they lived and the people that they were, um, you know, and the impact that they had in their short time that they were uh, alive. That brings us to 89, becoming the chief of detectives. Now, your stint as chief of detectives was interesting because you had a myriad of interesting cases, some bordering on the on terrorism. I mean, there was the Brian Watkins murder. That wasn't terrorism. He was a, a tragic tourist from Utah who was murdered trying to protect his mother from a robbery. But two cases I want to ask you about because they go hand in hand. When Rabbi Kahani got shot dead in 1990, November of 90, the guy that shot him, El Saeed Nosser, later had a role in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. You know, and, and the guy that paid for his legal defense fund was Bin Laden, none other than Osama Bin Laden. So looking back at Kahani's murder, then we get the Trade Center Part 1 in 1993. From your perspective as a chief, you have counter Well, we didn't have counterterrorism back then. We had the Joint Terrorism Task Force. You had the bomb squad on this case. Obviously, you had the federal agents on it, on it too. How did you run the, that particular investigation in 93? Well, 93, uh, basically the, the heavy hit is there were the, uh, the uh, uh, federal task force, you know, mm. detectives and all. So they kind of ran with the ball there. I mean, I was abreast of what they were doing, but uh, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, they kind of were the lead uh, investigation in that. Mm. Uh, I'll tell you one thing about it. They could have brought that tower down if it, uh, you know, the, they were almost there because the way that the uh, World Trade Centers were built, I don't know, the, the towers, the steel structures went straight. The concrete floors were just like stiffness for the, for the uh, upright uh, beams. Mm -hmm. So when, they, when that bomb went off, it blew up. I think it took down three or four stories of the floors that were collapsed into the thing. So those beams, you, if, when I got to the scene, you could actually see them shaking like that. They had to be stiffened immediately, or otherwise that building would have collapsed. So they could have been successful the first time out. And uh, a lot of credit that uh, uh, was an emergency service cop was in the was looking in the back and. The bell housing of a, a vehicle, you know, the back where the back with the big bell housing, he found the truck bell housing where where all the uh, passenger cars were parked. You know, and the, the parking lot, the building itself, they would put trucks on one side and uh, vehicles on the other side, passenger vehicles. He found a truck bell housing where the passenger cars were. And he you know, uh, there was still the uh, VIN number is all over the car. It's not just in one spot. And it's on the that portion there. They call them secret spots. It's on the bell housing. And they were able to identify the truck, run it back, and to the, there was a rental. And they told you how stupid they are. They, they came back to get their money that they had put their deposit. They actually came back for the deposit. That's how they did. Yeah. But, uh, but the Kahani homicide, uh, we were sitting there, and he had a list of Sadir. Uh, Sadir? No, sir. El Saeed, no, sir. Yeah, he had a list. And interesting was it was, it was supposed to be a hit list. And one a city official, I won't give his name. He said, do you think he could put my name on that list? He, he wanted to be on the hit list of the... the, the, the <laughs> so that was another funny part. But anyway, that night I told him in the office, in the squad, in the 19th squad, I told the squad commander, uh, Morris, I said, hey, you concentrate on the homicide. 
I said, you, you make a case for the homicide. And uh, the chief from the uh, intelligence division was there. I can't think of his name offhand. I said, you have all the contacts with the feds. I said, so you, you can kind of be a liaison with the feds, whatever they need, or however. But I want, I want this kept separate, you know, because it's going to lead to international things with Kahani and all. I said, and we don't, we don't want to. We don't want to split it or have uh, my guys working on worrying about what's going on in Israel. I, I th that's baloney. I said, you, Morris, you just make a homicide case. You know? And that, we couldn't make a homicide case. I think he was actually convicted of, of uh, possession of a weapon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's true. Hey, that's not bad for a 90 year old guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, we never did make a, a homicide. But there's a little uproar about that, you know, but we just didn't have it, you know. We didn't have any witness. Uh, nobody could identify him or pick him out of a lineup, you know. Mm -hmm. As, and yet he was he was in that hotel, ran in, ran out. So, uh, but that's what happened there. But with that bombing, uh they could have brought that tower down then, you know. So we were we were fortunate. A lot more people could have gotten killed. Absolutely. Uh, I you think know. there was what, six people killed in that bombing. Yep. It was well, te yeah, technically six because one of the victims was pregnant. It was her and her unborn child. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, Monica is, uh, Rodriguez Smith uh, and her unborn child were among the victims. And you know, yeah, that that case. As I've covered it numerous times, I'm doing a show on it next next month. I'll give more details as we get closer. But that case, it was Joe Hanlon from the ATF and our friend Don Sadawi from the bomb squad that uh, made that discovery with the fire marshal by the name of Phil Marr, uh, who uncovered that VIN number. And since Don knew cars because he went to an automotive high school, he was able to pick that VIN number out. And that helped the three of them basically help yeah, break that started. case open. That started yeah. the ball rolling. Yeah. Yep, and it was it was that discovery that uh, that uh, really helped put that case uh, to rest for the for the time being. Of course, at least until one But Kahani, yeah, that that um, case was particularly fascinating in that. You no, know, he snuck in. I think he was wearing a disguise. He might have been dressed in Hasidic Jewish garb when he pulled the trigger on Kahani. But Mordecai Janansky, who was the detective in Midtown at the time, was a friend of mine. He's been on the show, and he later went out to counterterrorism. That night, when I asked him about it, because he grew up Jewish in Brooklyn, went to the yeshiva, the whole nine yards, you know, he, he was saying to me that that night I was telling everybody that would listen on the scene, I can assure you this has nothing to do with New York City. This is strictly related to the, I'm paraphrasing him, the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. This was a hit, and it was a hit. And yes, yes. If, you, if you look at the war on terror, that's the op at least in the United States. That's the opening salvo. Ninety three. Everybody points to it, and I understand. But Kahani's murder—that was the first shot, literally and figuratively, yeah. in this ongoing war on terror. Yeah, yeah. Good. That's why I told them this, I separated them. Mm -hmm. I said I want the homicide part, and then the other part about the international, but whatever that's going to lead to. Mm -hmm. So we kept them separate. You know. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, they were. Uh, the Howard Beach case was another one that, uh, well, no, I was the chief of these. That was a good one, too. Yeah, I know you have some stories from it. If you want to share them, go ahead. No, no. Mm. All right. I, was, I was talking about the bomb squad, though. I'll mm -hmm. never forget. Uh, Lieutenant come in, uh, who ran the office outside, Artie Marini. He said, uh, So I forget who the detective was. He just got a new bomb dog. You know, and I'm a, I'm a dog lover. I said, really, bring him in. So he brings him in. I'm looking at the dog, and I'm looking. I said, are you crazy? He said, what's the matter, Chief? I said, that dog is a retriever. I said, you don't want him to pick up the bomb and bring it back to you. I said, you should get a pointer. Get a, This way he points at the door. At the bomb. He doesn't pick it up and bring it back to you. Everybody had a good laugh. Yeah, no, those those canines. Uh, I'll never, I never, I'll never forget a, a story that my friend uh, Dan McNally told me. 
from the bomb squad that Dan, I asked him about the dogs and he was in the United Nations one day with his late partner, Danny Richards, who got killed on 9-11, sadly. And the two Dannys were going through the hallway and this hallway, it, it doesn't have any furniture. It has nothing. Like it's just a straight corridor. The dog, it's a she that they were with, stops and sits down and she's looking up at the ceiling. And they're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to look at the ceiling. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a bomb, thankfully, but it was a briefcase in the ceiling. And she, and she didn't see it, but she was so astute and observing because they're, they're trained by smell. Something's out of the ordinary here that she sat down. And if that was a bomb, hey, she saves, she would have saved some lives there. So that was, it's very impressive because they've never, they've never physically found a bomb. But they've never missed one either uh, in their history. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're very, very great dogs. Uh, one more thing I want to ask you about before we get to the final segment. And this has been a great conversation. I'm so glad that we could cross paths finally is leaving the job. You left in the mid nineties. By that point, you'd seen the evolution of New York city from good to bad, back to good. You know, by the mid nineties, things were looking up again for the city. Um, you had a full career. I don't think you have any regrets in talking with you tonight, but nonetheless, when you didn't have to wake up and go to one PP anymore, when you could finally relax that transition from a cop, which is something you'd been for almost 40 years by that point to just private, civilian life was that difficult for you uh yeah because uh I, you know i i loved the job i loved it it was good to me uh but even if it hadn't been good to me i would have loved what i did and all but uh so it was interesting like you said i i saw the city the transformation of the city uh, from good to bad, back to good, you know, and uh, I'm, I was in on the the transformation back to good. And, you know, a lot has been written about that. Uh, like the, uh, a lot of people uh, talk about Mayor Giuliani, uh, which is true, deserves all the credit. They talk about Commissioner Bratton, you know, very true. But there's a guy that very rarely gets named that was right in the middle of that. And uh, he was uh, an eccentric sergeant from transit authority. And he became a commissioner. Bratton brought him in, Jack Maple. Mm -hmm. Man, he deserves a lot of credit for creating the comp stat. So, uh, Want to hear another funny story? Please. <laughs> When Jack, re, uh, when Jack retired, I had been retired, jo uh, John Miller calls me and he says, Jack would like you to be at his retirement party. I said, sure, it'd be my pleasure. So they had it at Elaine's in Manhattan mm -hmm. and John was this mess of ceremonies and all. And then he finally said, if anybody would like to talk about Jack Maples, you can get up and stand up, you know, go. Guys were popping up. So I raised my hand and I got up and I said, I would like to thank Jack Maple and Louis Animal for being so hard on the people at the Comstat meeting that made they made me the beloved chief of the department. Because there were the three of us sat at the Comstat meeting. And Louis and Jack would, you know, they were doing their thing and if they, they weren't picking on detectives, so I didn't, I didn't get too involved with them. I so, but they made me the beloved chief. You know? <laughs> but Jack Maple, um, you never hear his name mentioned, yeah. but uh, he was he was a, a very an integral part of that whole business, you know. And he left us too soon. He left us way too soon. He died of cancer in August of 2001. Bob Geist, the retired detective from second grade, he has another question for you. He says, after your career, did you have any interesting hobbies or activities that you were involved in? I was a golfer. <laughs> there you go. A golfer. And I always had, uh, I always enjoyed drawing, you know, not painting, right. pencil drawing. You know? So sure. between the drawing and the golf and uh, God, I lo love the garden. Uh, and how I moved out out here to Greenport, you know, so, uh, so I kept busy that way. Uh, but uh, my true love was the uh, was the golf, you know. Mm -hmm. 
a left-handed golfer. I was lifted. Well, that's when when I played ball. I, was, I played first base. You know? mm-hmm. So, uh, but uh, well, they anybody anybody in the job who knew about my prof- playing professional ball, they would come to me and say, "We hear you couldn't hit the curve ball." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, I couldn't hit the curve. Couldn't hit the fastball either." <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out just fine. I think it was a blessing in disguise in disguise you didn't go pro because hey, he ended up having a career to be proud of that we've done a deep dive on tonight. Chief, this has been a pleasure and an honor. I have a segment I always wrap up with. It's called Rapid Fire. It's five hit and run questions from me, five answers from you. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. And you can say pass if you want. First, funniest colleagues you ever worked with. Funniest? Yes. Uh funniest guy. Ronnie Fuchsberg. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you a funny story about Ronnie. We Go were ahead. partners. We're riding to, we're going to the 23rd precinct. That's where we both were when we graduated the academy. And my wife, Fran, had told me she was pregnant that day. Mm-hmm. So we're riding to work and Ronnie's driving. And they said, Ronnie, you know, Fran is pregnant. He says, do I know, stupid? Do you know? <laughs> so that was my funniest part. But you know, I, I hope people realize what I'm saying is that I always, Jewish comedians, there was an awful lot of them. And there's got to be something in the, the nature that, that makes it funny. But he was funny. He was just, I mean, just talking, he was funny. You know? mm-hmm. So that was my funniest. Second, best advice anyone ever gave you. Best advice anyone ever gave you. My father. He told me, learn a trade and never use it. And the other one he always told me about, never leave the girl that loves you. Hmm. Those were the two things that, uh, that were kind of, I kind of always thought of, you know. Uh, but that was it. Now I'm thinking about him. He died early too. He was only 50 years old, my father, when he passed mm. away. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Next. Third <laughs> funniest call you ever responded to. Oh, gee. Funniest call. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, it, it isn't funny. But I mean, if, how about strangers call? There you go. Go ahead. Okay. A double homicide where in Queens, where the perp decapitated the two victims and changed their heads. I mean, it's a, I tell you, it, when, when, I, when I got to the scene, I, you know, they told me, I don't believe. I said, what kind of a wacko is this guy? You know? So that's the strangest homicide I've ever found. Oh, God. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York City. <laughs> Unbelievable, you know? Yeah. You see things, you, you, you wonder how people can do things like that, you know? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I don't know either. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York City. Favorite restaurant? Uh, uh, I really had a favorite restaurant in uh, in my hometown in Limbrook. Uh, Gallery Four, little Italian restaurant, you know. And uh, my wife, we, we lived in Thin, Thin Limbrook over thirty years, so mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times we ate dinner there. And Family grew up there, you know, with the four daughters. You know, so that was it. it was, Manhattan, I don't know. I was never impressed with Manhattan. I'm a suburb guy mm-hmm. from Brooklyn, you know. The, Manhattan with the New York Giants. And I'm a Brooklyn Dodger guy, so I didn't like <laughs> There you go. Uh, and then finally, knowing what you know now, if you can go back in time, and give advice to a younger version of yourself, what would you tell a young Joe Varelli? Move around. 
don't get complacent in the police department. You know, uh, study. It's a boss's job. Get out of the get out of the street and get up on the side up on the sidewalk on the curb at least. So that's what I would say. You know, uh, don't get pr- complacent and uh, study. Chief, I I loved loved this interview and the audience loved it too. Before we go, are are there any shout outs that you want to give to anyone or anything? Uh, you know, uh, I uh, I think about the the job quite a bit, you know, uh, and the simp- and with the uh, with the past week, it's been one of the saddest days of my life with the uh, two police officers, you know, mm-hmm. whatever or more. So. Uh, I just hope that the uh, people in the city find it, you know, hey, the nicest people in the world wear that blue uniform. And the guys that are in civilian clothes, they're not bad either. Well said. Well said. And my shout out as always, well, first of all, to you, you were fantastic and it was a pleasure. And I'll shout out the, my, our friends in the live chat. Uh, of course, uh, I don't want to miss anybody. So if I do, I apologize. Scotty Wagner out of the 2-3, new former New York City housing police officer and detective as well, detective in the hostage negotiation team. Uh, also, the aforementioned Bob Geis, a second grade detective, Joe Murray, former uh, police officer and defense attorney, currently defense attorney, uh, Ruth Ann Griffin, Angela Ang out of the 13th precinct did 20 years there. Uh, Peter Pranzo, the legendary 3-2 uh, lieutenant, street crime as well. Uh, just trying to go here and make sure that I get everyone, like I said. Michalina Serino, thank you for being here as well. Gina G, uh, there was also a factual breakdown. Uh, Tony Giorgio from the ceremonial unit, who was on this show a couple episodes ago, he said there's a funny story about you when he was uh, swearing you in as chief of detectives. You said two R's, two L's when he asked <laughs> <laughs> how your last name was spelled. So he's here tonight. And he says hello. So thank you to all you guys for tuning in. And thank you, as always, to the guest. Uh, Chief, you were outstanding. Don't sign off yet. We'll say goodbye off the air. So stick around uh, while I say goodbye to the audience. So, guys, thank you, as always, for coming up on the Mike the New Haven podcast. It is going to be an interesting show. I'm a big New York Knicks fan, as you guys know. So Chris Childs, the former Knicks point guard who helped the Knicks get to the finals in 1999, he'll be here on Friday. And uh, coming up next week, February 7th, retired federal agent, customs agent, Miles Sun. And February 8th, Alice Gaynor, the uh, Emmy Award winning anchor reporter from Channel 2, WCBS New York. She'll be here as well. So a couple of really good shows on tap for the Mike DeVaven podcast. In the meantime, on behalf of retired NYPD chief of detectives, Joe Borelli, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Have a great rest of your night.